This morning, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be reading from chapter 5 in just a minute or two. For those of you that have been with us for the past several weeks, you know that we're in a sermon series entitled Deep Blue Faith. And we've talked about faith, we've talked about love, we've talked about the family. And now this morning we're going to, we're going to go fishing. Did you bring your fishing pole this morning? Probably not. But uh, we as God's people <clears throat> are to be fishermen. And uh, when Jesus called his first disciples, in the early part of the Gospels, we can read about his call upon their life. And uh, on one occasion, Jesus joined some of the fishermen that became disciples. And he got in the boat with them and they went out into the water, and he instructed them to cast their nets into the deep for a great catch. And uh, Peter spoke up and said, uh, Lord, we've been fishing all night and we haven't caught anything, but just because you tell me to do that, I will do it. And he was obedient to the words of Jesus, and as a result, they caught so many fish, the nets began to break. And that's what it is to be obedient to the Lord. I don't care what aspect of your life you're talking about. When we hear the words of Jesus from his word, when we hear him speaking to us through the power of his spirit, and when we obey his call upon our lives, he promises a blessing. A blessing that cannot be overstated. A blessing that will empower us to be the disciples that he wants us to be. And so Jesus calls his disciples and they can really equate to what it is to be fishermen because several of them left their nets, the Bible says, immediately they left everything in order to follow Jesus. And that's the kind of obedience and surrender the Lord often calls us to make that we will listen to his call upon our lives and uh, become what he has called us to be. I don't know how many of you, I'm kind of dating myself again here, how many of you remember the little chorus we used to sing as kids in uh, Bible school, vacation Bible school, uh, about uh, being fishers of men? Uh, Jesus has called us to be fishers of men, fishers of men. And uh, uh, it's a great little chorus uh, that uh, tells us how important it is that we become fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, if you'll follow me. The second verse is, hear Christ calling, come unto me, come unto me, come unto me. Hear Christ calling, come unto me, and I will give you rest. So that little chorus <clears throat> really shares with us a message that's important. If we come unto the Lord and if we become what he wants us to be, which is fishers of men, well then he will give us rest, he will give us his blessing, and uh, we will really be the disciples that he has called us to be. So that kind of sets the stage this morning for where we're going as we think about casting our nets into the deep waters so that we can catch a fish for the glory of God. Not fish fish, but fishers of men. And I hope this morning that each and every one of us understand that a part of our discipleship is to be a witness for the Lord so that others will come to know him. And oftentimes we struggle with that, don't we? How do I become a, a better witness for the Lord? How do I become more of what the Lord would have me be as far as sharing my faith. There are so many excuses and so many reasons why we don't do that. And I think one of the major reasons that we don't get involved in sharing our faith is because of fear. I don't know how many of you go back this far here at Fairfield, but years ago we had a man here as a guest speaker. His name was Bill Fay. And uh, the title of his book and the conference that he, we had him for was Sharing Your Faith Without Fear. Anybody remember that besides me? Okay, several hands. Sharing Your Faith 
without fear. And I appreciated Bill Fay because he was a successful businessman that at one time did not live for Jesus at all, probably even scoffed at Christianity. But like is often the case, a man like him, once they come to faith, they become a dynamic witness for the Lord. And that's what happened to Bill Fay. When he came to Christ, the Lord transformed his life in such a way that he committed his life to sharing his faith and to helping teach and encourage Christians to share their faith just like he was attempting to do. And to do it without fear. Because oftentimes we're paralyzed by the fears that we have of what people's reaction is going to be to us about sharing our faith. But I really believe that each and every one of us, if we truly are believers, we truly are attempting to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will develop a passion for the lost so that in some way, big or small, we'll share with them about what Jesus means to us. And that may, may simply mean that you develop a personal testimony of what the blessings of the Lord mean to you and what the Lord has done in your personal life. I know oftentimes believers make excuses for not sharing their faith because they, they say, I don't know enough about the Bible. Well, shame on, shame on us if we don't know enough about the Bible but you know, we don't have to be Bible scholars in order to share our faith. Especially if the Lord has done a miraculous work in our life. And if we appreciate deeply the salvation that he has given to us and the indwelling of his spirit that, we're, that produces within us the love, the joy, the peace, and all of the fruit of the spirit that belongs to the believers. And so we develop a testimony, and so when the door opens, just using our testimony with people that we meet to share with them about what Jesus has done in our life may initiate within their life the motivation to at least be open to faith and find out more about Jesus. You know, oftentimes we use the, the term that we are to win people to Christ, and I think that's great. We ought to win people to Christ. But you know, there's nothing that we can do in the flesh, even as disciples, even as believers, to win people to Christ unless the Lord sends his Holy Spirit to bring conviction into the heart of that person who needs the Lord. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot be fishers of men without the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. And so when we are faithful to the Lord to obey his call upon our lives and share our testimony and the good news of the gospel with other people, we don't need to worry about the result. The result is in the hands of God. We plant the seed and God will do his miraculous work to convict people of their need for a savior. And that can dissolve a lot of the fear that we have and apprehensions we have about sharing our faith with other people. And so we understand that the marching orders of the church are to go out and be a witness for the Lord in our community and wherever we go. And how we best do that is what we want to talk about this morning. Certainly sharing your testimony and sharing scripture is a part of that. But Jesus gives us in our text this morning some encouraging words about how we can be his witnesses without being terribly intimidated. So read with me, if you will, Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 13. Matthew 5 and verse 13. This is the words of Jesus. He's speaking. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way 
that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus here, I think, gives us a little two-step formula that we can understand and in understanding how to be salt and light, we can live our lives as believers and that will permeate and saturate the world in such a way that people will know that we belong to the Lord. One of the great preachers of yesteryear, a man whose name you will certainly recognize, I think, was Charles Spurgeon. <clears throat> he was a pastor of one of the greatest churches of the 19th century in London, England. It was called the Met Metropolitan Tabernacle. That church was also known for winning people to Christ. As a matter of fact, that church became known as a soul trap. Wouldn't it be great if every church in America became known as a soul trap? That we, are, that we were drawing people to the Lord, and we've talked about this in past weeks. We draw people to the Lord by loving people, not by judging them. And so we draw people to the Lord in such a way that they, they know that we belong to the Lord because they can see it by the way that we live. They can see it in the love that we have for the Lord as well as for other people. And therefore the church should become a soul trap. And that's what happened in the church that Charles Spurgeon was the pastor. One day a man came to visit the church and began talking with Spurgeon. And he asked him, what's the real secret behind the success of this church? And Spurgeon led him down into the basement where he showed him a prayer room with several church members at that time praying for the salvation of the city. And Spurgeon looked at the man and said, that's the secret right there. Prayer. Drawing upon the power of God because in the strength of the flesh we cannot do it but in the power of the Spirit God will lead us to shine our light wherever we go and the world will identify Jesus with us. And so every church can be a soul trap. But it has to first realize that the power to win people to Christ comes not from great programming or dynamic preaching, but from the very power of God. He is the only one that can draw people unto himself. And he can, he can use us as a part of that process to do that. And let me just inject here, if I may, this morning, a commercial about our prayer meeting tonight at 6.30 in the chapel. Fairfield Christian Church has always been a praying church, and we need to continue to be a praying church. In the culture and in the world in which we live, there's never been a greater time for us to be a praying people, praying about the needs that we know about within our family of believers right here at Fairfield, but also play, praying for our community that God will use us as a church family to make an impact for him and this community as he sends his power upon us to be his faithful witnesses. So instead of relying so much upon the techniques that many suggest for reaching the lost, we need to focus on trusting God to do a great work through you and me by the power of his Holy Spirit. We can pray for our lost friends and family members we can pray for our community. We can pray for the world that God, by the power of his spirit, will move again to bring people to Jesus Christ. I know most of us here are aware that we are living in difficult times, and the times in which we live certainly point to the fact that we're living in the last days. And since that is true, and if you believe that is true, well then the urgency of the task that we have to become fishers of men becomes obvious. We need to be influencing those around us to come to Christ before it's everlastingly too late. And so becoming a fisher of men is so important. The Apostle Paul had an approach to fishing in 1 Corinthians 9.19. He said, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. I love the passion and the heart of the Apostle Paul. 
He was not a slave. However, he voluntarily made himself a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ and the purpose of making Jesus his master was so that he could win as many as possible to the Lord. That was the call of Paul and the mission of his life. It was about being a slave to win people to Christ. And the only effective way to bring people to Jesus is to draw them to him as we share with them the light of his love. And so back to our text this morning in Matthew 5, Jesus called his disciples and he encouraged them to be salt and light, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Well, let's take a closer look for a moment at this salt. What was Jesus really talking about? What is the purpose? What part does salt have to play in our lives. When you think of the word salt, you might think of a, a lot of things. Winter is around the corner. You might think about the salt that they put on the highway to melt the ice. You may think about your diet, and maybe you're eating too much salt, and that can affect your blood pressure and have all kinds of difficulties as far as your health is concerned. But most of us know what salt is, and the common use of salt is it will flavor our food. You know, we get that heaping pile of mashed potatoes on our plates, and if you just eat the potatoes alone and they haven't been salted, they're just kind of okay. But if you put a little salt on those potatoes, boy, they really taste a lot better. We've just... <laughs> amen. We <laughs> There's a brother that loves salt. We just come through the sweet corn season. Carolyn and I love sweet corn, and so every time we go to the soup, uh, to the uh, grocery, we'll pick up a couple of ears of sweet corn, and we'll fix it, and we'll cut it off the cob, and it'll be on our plate. And there's some really good sweet corn out there, and it's pretty tasty in and of itself. But what a difference it makes when you sprinkle a little salt on the sweet corn. Now, how many of you are ready for lunch? <laughs> My point this morning is this, we know the purpose of salt. We know that it really adds flavor to the food that we eat. Salt preserves also. Salt purifies. There are a lot of different characteristics and uses for salt, but most of us are most keenly aware of how we use it with our food. When Jesus told the disciples to be the salt of the earth, he was asking them to permeate, to penetrate the world, the culture in which they lived so that they could make a difference. So that the world be would become a more tasteful place. The world would be more tasteful because of the salt that they were sprinkling into the world, sprinkling into the culture. And so it is with us. We can simply, as lovers of Jesus Christ, go out and live our lives and ask God on a daily basis, Lord, just open a door for me today, maybe more than one, and let me be salt in the world today. Let me permeate, let me saturate someone's life today, and may what I share with them help them see in some small way, a little bit of you and your love for the world. Quite honestly, as if, if believers through the ages would have been more obedient to this encouragement of Jesus in Matthew 5 to be the salt of the earth, our world wouldn't be in the shape that it's in today. And so we have a tremendous challenge before us to make a difference in the world by being the salt of the earth. Now, I mentioned that salt purifies, and salt also preserves. If you go out and you're working real hard and you get sweaty, okay, and you nick yourself or just cut yourself a little bit, what usually happens, there's salt in your 
sweat and your perspiration. There's salt and that can kind of sting when you cut yourself. And that's not a bad thing. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, it's like rubbing salt into someone's wound? Have you ever heard that? And the whole idea behind that phrase is it, it stings, it hurts. Well, when we are salt and we go into the world, we don't have to hurt the world, but we can help purify the world through our influence and through our testimony and through the message that we're carrying. And it's so important that as fishers of men called by God to be his followers, his disciples, that we be the salt of the earth. Because that's what Jesus would have us be. I mentioned the salt also preserves. Without salt, things can rot and become pretty stinky. And this world has become pretty stinky because of the lack of good influence, Christian influence. And so we could go on and on about the powerful impact of salt in our culture as Jesus is teaching it here from the Sermon on the Mount. But I think that we get the picture. If we want to be fishers of men, we need to commit ourselves to being the salt of the earth and to go out and flavor the lives of people that we meet by sharing with them what makes life the best. And that's Jesus Christ. Secondly, in Matthew 5, Jesus challenges the disciples to be the light of the world. Now we know what light is. Light is very important because it shows us the way. Especially if it's dark. But you know light in the academic world is very, very complex. As I was reading about that this week, even the experts about life readily admit that light is something they don't completely understand. What makes light light? What makes it so dramatic? And where does light come from? There are a lot of answers to questions that we don't have about light. But one thing we know, that light in the darkness shows us the way. And Christians are to show one another the way. That's how we help one another. But Christians can also show, help show, the world the right way to go, and that is the influence that can lead many to Christ. It makes a huge difference. In the ancient world, lamps served a vital function, much like our lights do today. They enabled people to see and to work in the dark to avoid stumbling, to avoid the obstacles along the way. And the Jews also understood light as an expression of inner beauty, truth, and the goodness of God. Jesus challenged his disciples to walk in the light even as he is in the light. And elsewhere in Scripture we're told to avoid the darkness because darkness throughout the Scripture represents evil. It represents sin. And so walk in the light of God's love and live that kind of life by obeying him. And then our light is like a city on a hill. It can be seen from far away. And our lives can radiate the light of God's love and can be seen by people all around us because we've committed ourselves to being the light. And I hope this morning every one of us will commit ourselves to being the light of the world. I've told this story before, but it's so dramatic I'll never forget it. Years and years ago, we took a little vacation and we were in Kentucky where Mammoth Cave is. How many of you have been to Mammoth Cave? How many of you have taken the tour to go down into the bottom of Mammoth Cave? And they probably pulled on you the same thing they pulled on us. You got to the bottom, what did they do? They shut off the lights. I'll never forget it. I've never been in a darker spot. I literally took my hand and waved it in front of my face and I could not see my hand. It was dark, 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 dark. It was dark. (laughs) 
And the darker the night, the brighter the light. Now, the application for us as believers is obvious. Dale, let's cut the lights for a moment, please. Now, someone left a little light on up there in the corner. And not everybody can see that, but you can see the exit lights. And you can see the lights through the doors and even under the doors. And so we can't duplicate the darkness that occurs at the bottom of Mammoth Cave. And we can't even duplicate the darkness that is so prevalent in this world. But one thing that we know through this little illustration this morning, that it, we would have, many of us would have a hard time getting, getting out of here without the light. And there's people all over this world this morning that are going to have a hard time getting out of this world without the light. Okay, let's have the lights again, please. I'm thankful for the light of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I'm thankful that we've been called to be the light of the world. Because each and every one of us have been strategically placed as believers, as disciples, to shine our light. May I just say to you this morning that you may be somewhere you don't want to be. Maybe you're in a difficult job and you'd like to get out of that job and the sooner you can get out of that job the better. Maybe you're in a difficult marriage and you're having a hard time in your marriage. Maybe there are family issues. Maybe there are financial issues. And we could go on and on with a lot of different situations in life that can really be discouraging. But let me just give you a little insight that can encourage you. Do you really believe that God does not know where you are right now? Do you really believe that he doesn't see the situation in your job or the situation in your marriage or the situation with your family or you really think that he doesn't know and see the financial situation that you're in, the hardship, whatever it may be this morning. God knows it's not a secret to God where we are. And my encouragement to each and every one of us this morning, regardless of how good or how difficult the circumstances are in your life this morning, understand this, that God has strategically placed you where you are right now and wants you to be salt and light. Amen. He wants you to shine your light on the job, to work hard at your marriage and shine your light in your marriage and in your family and learn how to be faithful in your finances. God's got lessons for all of us to learn regardless of the circumstances that we're in. He knows where we are right now and let's be encouraged by the fact that he knows where we are and he wants us to be salt and light for him. Because our salt and our light in difficult circumstances can be so much more effective in difficult circumstances than they may be if the circumstances were great. So please know that God has strategically placed you wherever you are. doesn't mean that where you are is going to be permanent. You may not be miserable for a long time. He may rescue you from some of the difficulty of your life. But to be obedient to him is what's important. Don't expect God to rescue you from a situation where you're trying to do something outside of his will. Just walk in his will, walk in his way, and show the way by shining the light. And God will use you, he will bless you, and he will... Make the job better, make the marriage better, make the family better, make the finances better. God will provide because he is faithful. Every time he is faithful. This morning will you be a fisher of men and will you cast your line, your nets out into the deep for a great catch? Because God wants to use each and every one of us as salt and light. 
Let me close with this little story. A young girl was with her mother one day and they were walking through a department store <coughs> and the girl's eyes were attracted to this string of this necklace of pearls. Now, ladies, you know the difference. There's pearls that are hung on a little rack out in the open for everybody to see and handle. And then there are pearls that are in the showcase under light that they won't, don't want us to handle. Now the one is very inexpensive and the other is very expensive. And so this girl saw this inexpensive necklace of imitation pearls. And she asked her mother if she could have those. And her mother said, well, you save your money and I'll bring you back. And then you can buy it. It was only 10 bucks. And so the girl, I mean, she really wanted these. And so she saved her money faithfully. It wasn't long she had the $10. And her mother did what she said she would do. She took her back to the store and the little girl bought this imitation necklace of imitation pearls. And she took it home and she was so enthralled with these pearls that she wore them just about every day and almost every place she went. And over a period of time, it seems like they weren't getting old. For some strange reason, she was really, really attracted to these pearls. And so one night she was in her room and her dad went up to her room and he walked in and had a little small talk for a couple of minutes and then her dad said to her, honey, do you love me? And the little girl looked at him and she was surprised and said, Daddy, you know I love you. But then her dad said, will you give me your, your necklace? Will you give me your pearls? And her face just was in shock. And she looked down and she said, Daddy, I'll give you anything that I have but please don't ask me to give give you my pearls so the father didn't make a big case out of it they just talked for a little bit and he left a couple nights later he repeated the same thing he went to her room and visited with his daughter for a short time and he asked again honey do you love me she knew what was coming <laughs> daddy you know I love you well then, honey, will you give me your pearls? And again, she said, Daddy, I'll give you my favorite doll baby. But please don't ask me to give you my pearls. And so again, they talked for a couple of minutes and he left again. It was a few days later, the little girl came down to her dad downstairs in the living room and she came up to him and she had her pearls in her hand and she stretched out her hand to hand her pearls to her daddy and she said with tears in her eyes, Daddy, you know I love you and I want you to have my pearls. The father knew that this would probably happen at some point and so he was ready. And so he took the imitation pearl necklace from his daughter and then he reached into his pocket and he pulled out this little velvet bag. It's the kind of bag that you ladies would see in the lights under the glass in the jewelry store. And in that bag he opened it and he pulled out a beautiful pearl necklace that was obviously the real deal and very expensive. And he gave the real pearls to her, his daughter and said, honey, I just want you to have these real pearls because I love you so much. And with tears, she couldn't believe it that she was going to get a necklace of genuine pearls. And her daddy helped, him, helped her put them on her neck and she was just so, so excited. 
You know, when I read that little story, it reminded me of how God wants to work in our lives. There are so many times when we have our hands so firmly a hold of the things of this world. And Jesus comes to us and he says, do you love me? And of course we'll say, yes, Lord, we love you. Then Jesus says, let go of what you have and give it to me and let me take care of you. And sometimes we'll say, like the little girl, please don't ask me for that. You know how much I love that. But you know what? If we are willing to give up the things of this world and obey God's call upon our lives, God will turn the imitations of this world, the things that aren't very valuable at all, to something that's more valuable than this whole world. And that's the promise that God has made to us. If we will only be salt and light in a world that is very dark, and when we commit ourselves to being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the blessings of the Lord will come upon us in an amazing, amazing way. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to share in your word. And Lord, we're thankful for your call upon our lives that we might give up the imitation things of this world for something, our Father, that is more valuable than everything in this world. So Lord, I pray that each of us would uh, commit ourselves anew to being fishers of men, that we would cast our nets into the deep water and that we would expect our Father your blessing as you bring many into your kingdom because of our faithfulness to be salt and light. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that needs a Savior, I pray that they would let go of whatever they have a hold of, that they would surrender to you and give their life to you this morning through faith and obedience to the gospel. So move here today, our Father, in our hearts by the power of your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.